All right, so reinforcement learning, planning, and optimizations. Um, Leora and I do research here at UCF uh, with UCF and the Air Force Research Laboratory. And uh, we talk, we do a lot of research in planning and reinforcement learning. Um, AlphaGo Zero is one of the most um, well known uh, recent reinforcement learning like feats. Uh, there is an MCTS like algorithm and MCTS stands for Monte Carlo tree search. We're going to talk about that more later. Um, but this allows you to look ahead, look into the environment. So um, see if we had a rat um, in this maze has to plan how to get to the end while getting that piece of pizza. So um, Oh, hello, Pedro. How you doing? Welcome to our presentation. Glad to be here. Yep. So we're talking about what does planning maybe mean in a reinforcement learning con context? Um, does anybody kind of want to butt in and have any have have any thoughts on that? We could kind of discuss before we get into things. Um maybe it has some sort of foresight or it's thinking about future steps possibly right. yeah there's definitely some look ahead thinking to future steps it's not just responding to or it is responding to one state at a time but it responds to that state and maybe models what future states could look like kind of plans ahead um and we'll go into what that means kind of more in the reinforcement learning context take my jacket off so i'm brett bissy i'm a machine learning intern and i'm a senior uh computer science major and stat minor uh my research involves reinforcement learning and planning i work with single agent as well as multi-agent environments um I mostly work with discrete action spaces, grid worlds, card games, board games. A lot of reinforcement learning is continuous action space, um, uh, like, or, you know, different than kind of these discretized games. Um, I don't have as much experience with those, but those are, you know, just as interesting and just as uh, relevant. And I kind of mentioned MCTS. Uh, that is the main algorithm that we've kind of worked with and published a paper um, kind of optimizing, and that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, proximal policy optimization is another interesting, uh, it's a just kind of a different way to train your network when you're dealing with reinforcement learning. Um, DQNs and neural fictitious self-play. And that self-play, uh, part of the acronym, it has to do with this planning as well. It's um, it, it that's typically used in card games like poker um and the self-play aspect allows an agent to, to kind of look ahead before a move play with them play with themselves um i also do some research in adversarial computer vision uh, model attacks so this is like if you have an image and you want to see uh uh, you want you know how it's classified in a model and you want to try to trick that model into classifying it a different way it's kind of an interesting uh, field of machine learning and yeah I mean I'd love to talk about this uh, uh, after if you have any questions about how to get into research or these specific topics so planning and reinforcement learning it oftentimes requires a model based approach. And I kind of mentioned this earlier. Um, a model based approach means that we are uh, we uh, our agent sees a state of the environment, and then it kind of models the environment and looks ahead in that model environment to try to plan um, a model free approach would see a state and make a decision instantaneously without planning ahead. But that decision could potentially be a better decision than planning ahead if you have a model, if your 
uh, model free approach is trained well enough. Um, so there's look ahead in the model environment based on the current state. Uh, model, modern implementations use value approximations to reduce planning time. So this means that within our model environment, within um, the kind of search through the different game states within that model environment, we don't have to search every state to completion um, of the game because we can kind of like approximate how good a certain state is with a deep neural network. Um, and this is kind of how neural nets have encouraged growth in these areas of reinforcement learning. Like Monte Carlo tree search is a pretty old algorithm, uh, but it's too uh, time consuming and you could, and it's not scalable to like general reinforcement learning. Um, but if you can approximate states within this tree search, you can really reduce your time. Um, so if you look at this, you guys have probably already started looking at this uh, graphic. Um, if you start, we'll say we'll start at the experience. Um, uh, let's actually start at the acting. So this is your agent and it acts and it does an action and there's an experience. If, if you had a direct reinforcement learning, um, you would get a value policy straight from that experience and it would continue acting and it would just kind of go in that loop on the right side with the orange um, arrow. But if you had a planning based approach, a model based approach, um, after that experience, you would build out your model, you would plan uh, based on that model, and your value would be coming from that model um, rather than the direct reinforcement learning route. This is kind of an interesting graphic I found on the internet um, that compares both approaches. If you look at the time, it's 545. Uh, the model-based approach would be checking the traffic on your phone. The model-free approach would just be knowing that at 545, you don't take the highway. So, you know, one is much more data efficient. You don't have to build out this whole plan of this traffic and what's going to happen, whereas the other um, could be more accurate, but more costly. And with Monte Carlo tree search and these planning algorithms run to completion, they could be 100% correct because you could just look ahead and figure out, uh, you know, every possible game state and every possible value that uh, or every possible like reward that you're going to get and figure out uh, the best move kind of like doing uh, this, um, what's it called? Uh, brute force approach. But in reinforcement learning, we're looking for a more generalized model, one that kind of mixes this planning with some approximation to, um, you know, find the uh, general approach. So within the game of Go, and this is a really interesting game for reinforcement learning, and it's what AlphaGo Zero is, you know, famous for. Um, we see a state on the board. We have a 19 by 19 board with uh, black and white tiles on it. It's a very simple state. It's a three layer tensor. We see this state, and uh, during a play step, then we start building out a tree of. Um, possible other states that that state could branch to. Um, if we're going down the tree, we go by a heuristic or like, uh, there's like a curiosity heuristic, there's a value heuristic, like these different heuristics can guide us down the tree, um, depending on like, you know, how we tune our hyperparameters, but mostly uh, based on uh, just like good traces that we've seen before in the tree. Once we reach a state that we haven't seen before, it's a leaf state and we want to expand that leaf state. Um, and we want to uh, get a value from that leaf state. Now in typical Monte Carlo tree search, we would run that leaf state to completion and assign a value to that um, node. But in modern implementations, um, that default that default policy 
will represent a call to the neural network. So once we get the value of how good one state in the game might be, uh, what reward we might get from it, we backpropagate that back up through this tree, um, through the game tree. And so all these nodes, uh, and they get like a discounted reward. So if you're at this final node, you might get a 0.99 reward. If you're at this uh, second node, you might get a 0.75 reward. And you kind of scale this back and each node um, like dynamically updates uh, how a certain state might be. So once we backpropagate that information up, um, we use that information to choose our next state. And once we take that, um, once we take that step, uh, that play step outside of the tree, we save that data. Um, uh, we save our entire trace um, as state action next, next state reward um, tuples or objects. Um, and we're going to train on that later to train that neural network that we use within the net. And that's what that kind of that line represents. So it's this kind of like cyclical, uh, we're using the neural net to help us make these play steps. And then the play steps are simultaneously training the neural network. So it's, it's kind of like, uh, second, like the neural network is helping us secondarily. Um, a lot of don't, don't, you don't have to read through all this. I'll, I know it's a big no-no to put all these words up on the slide, but um, how our uh, research kind of varies from typical AlphaGo Zero's uh, Monte Carlo tree search is we're bringing in automaton uh, through finite temporal logic to kind of represent environments and represent the games on games on grid worlds um, and these automaton are going to help us with these heuristics in the Monte Carlo tree search to give us another heuristic based on how satisfied or what state are we of this automaton. And so if you guys have taken discrete, um, this is probably somewhat uh, familiar to you. Um, we have these state machines, uh, just like uh, DFA, um, a, and we have these different atomic propositions. And on this one, for instance, we have hostile and safe, and they're representing different states that say our reinforcement learning agent could be in. Um, and given a formula, uh, this LTL, uh, linear temporal logic formula, uh, says um, G means to always be. So, uh, wants to always be in a hostile state until it is eventually in a safe state. Uh, so you, you could imagine how you could kind of nest these equations and create like a game sort of, and that's what we did with grid worlds. Uh, so important questions of our research is uh, how do we introduce an automaton guided reward shaping function within Monte Carlo tree search in order to increase data efficiency uh, how can we leverage state abstractions and formal verification techniques to train on explainable control policies? And can automaton guided reward shaping encourage emergent cooperative or competitive behavior in a multi-agent setting? Um, I am going to, if anybody has questions of their own, I know I kind of went through everything really quickly. Um, we do have some uh this is kind of like the halfway point um if anybody has like questions about mcts or anything on this page feel free so you said that we could use different heuristics together um like can you explain more like what like a heuristic is like how many can we have like what that is yeah um so this might make more sense when I start bringing in the uh, the automaton heuristic, but w basically each of these nodes in a game tree 
it builds up um, statistics that represent the history of rewards traveling through that node. Um, one statistic might be how many times has it traveled through this node? Another might be um, what's the average reward traveling through this node? Um, another may be like, we might have a curiosity heuristic. So if something hasn't been traveled to very much or something has already been traveled to, um, we don't travel to it in like some, like 5% of the time or something um, to encourage like us uh, uh, expanding the breadth of our game tree. Um, but yeah, we're, we're going to kind of go into more specifically what that means, but does that kind of help you? Yeah, that makes more sense. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So with these questions in mind, we're going to go forward into, um, kind of the new part of the, uh, the novel part of uh, the lecture. So automaton guided planning. Uh, this is where we bring our DFA in. We have some high level objective. It's uh, special instructions and it's formalized into a state machine. And I believe this is actually one of the state machines uh, for blind, for one of the grid world environments we had. And this has seven states, many, many more transitions. Um, and we're going to use like the transitions within this research to add a new heuristic. So we have our agent environment model. Um, they both come together in MCTS and we get an explainable control policy satisfying the objective. Part of the reason that uh, DFAs are uh, interesting in this context is because of like the explainable aspect. If you have something that says the agent is going to pick up two pieces of wood, then take them to the factory and then take them to the home space. That is like, you can explain how the agent is training. Whereas in typical reinforcement learning and planning, you kind of have to do the explaining afterwards and you kind of have to like, um, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of more up to the algorithm and more up to like, uh, the model to figure out an optimal policy and you have no way of kind of prodding it in different directions. Um, this can be, this can also be like a bad thing if you don't have a good high level objective, because you could like hurt your model. Um, you could. It, uh, you could potentially like, uh, you, like you, you own your, you could be only looking at one way to like solve the objective, depending on how you uh, formulate that. Okay. So learners will simultaneously reason about both a state representation that is like this grid world, this uh, environment with trees and a home and a factory. Now, let's simultaneously reason about both that and some objective representation. And this means these um, atomic propositions, if you can see it's no small text, uh, wood, tools, factory, build. So these are like uh, logical operators that represent stuff that's happening in the environment. So wood might mean agent has wood and you see the automaton is labeled with uh, how it's going to change to different states based on these logical operators based on the environment. So this subjective representation um, is like a key part of how we're going to learn um, because it kind of models our rewards, our intermediate rewards before we reach that final objective, which would be to get two pieces of wood, go to the factory and then go home. We're kind of modeling the in-between or we're, we're giving our agent a way to plan ahead um, to do those steps. Uh, whereas in typical planning, we would just give it the final objective. We would say, 
you need to do all of these things. Um, you would give that to the model and it would end up learning how to get two pieces of wood, uh, make a tool at the factory and be at the home space, but it wouldn't be like a guided, uh, as guided as using a DFA. And you don't see as good of rewards. And we'll go into the kind of these, uh, the experimental results from this as well. And I know that this is said it's a workshop. Um, we're going to have like a little tutorial at the end, if you guys want to do that. Um, but I was going to start with just kind of going through this research. Um, so this automaton guided tree search is going to go kind of go into how this automaton state heuristic is used within this research. So we have our selection state. Um, uh, this is uh, the argmax function is basically it's taking, uh, it's looking at all of the action space it's represented by this big A um, given a state and it's finding which action um, is going to uh, maximize this heuristic. And the Q is our uh, estimated value. The Y represents our estimated, or sorry, the Q represents our estimated value given a state. Oh. The U represents our, um, how many times we've been there. And the Y represents our estimated value given the state of the automaton. So that Y is where the automaton comes in. So say we moved from uh, state zero to state one, like in this diagram. Um, and we pick up a wood at state one. Not only are we looking at this entire state um, when we make this heuristic, we're also looking at the state of the automaton, which is when we travel from zero to one at the top right of your screen, um, when we grab that wood. So we're kind of taking into account this abstract representation of the space, as well as this other um, kind of physical environment-based representation. Um, uh, as we expand the neural network, we're using our CNN to um, uh, get our action probabilities as well as a value. It's a two-headed CNN. So we have one head that deals with the probabilities of the next action and the other head that deals with the value and we can get, um, um, it's relatively, it's like an actor critic architecture and you need both of these, um, both of these heads. Oh, backwards. Okay. So during the update, uh, this is after we've made our, um, after, when we're doing our back propagation, we like update all these values. And it's just kind of a lot of math, but um, this is like how each of the heuristics is updating on a back propagation, I believe. Um, and this is just, I don't want to go over this too much because I'll probably mess something up. <laughs> um, but, and then this, these slides kind of show you how we're simultaneously tracing through this tree as well as the automaton. We are. Oh yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Can you use an automaton in a free model where the heuristics are not combined during planning? Yes, you could, um, but you would have to be keeping track of these automaton statistics um, in some other sort of model. So if you're using the model free approach, um, it might not technically be model free if you're also doing the automaton. But I think basically, if you would keep like, you would keep track of the states in a certain uh, trace. Mm -hmm. um, and then you keep track of the automaton states within those states and kind of like 
save those within nodes that aren't a, a game tree and use those during your model free. Um, but it would still require kind of keeping track of these states. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. You could also potentially train another network. Um, I don't really thought about this on like the automaton states as you're training and you have like your automaton expected value, expected state, and um, another network that gives you your normal expected value. Oh, and you can mix those together. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay, so this is kind of just showing how we're doing this entire tree search to figure out our play policy and then we're moving to the next play step. Um, and this play policy we have, it basically has to do with uh, how many times have you done this state, uh, done this action in this state um, over how many times have you done uh, the sum of all the other times you've done other actions in this state. Um, so it's kind of like just one of the how that play step selection works. And then we're saving the play steps in our replay buffer, uh, which we're going to train uh, the network later. On. So here's an example um, called the blind craftsman. And this uh, LTL objective in English says, always get a wood and eventually go to the factory. Can you guys see my mouse? Yes. yes. yes we can. Okay. Always get a wood and eventually go to the factory. Uh, and eventually have three tools and build a home. So there are a good amount of states and this would require the, the agent to uh, pick up a wood, go to the factory, build a tool, go and pick up another wood, go to the factory and build a tool and eventually go to the home space. So it's like, it's kind of nesting that you have to do this first part three times because you need three tools to build the home. So it's kind of a complex planning uh, situation that a typical algorithm might struggle with. And even MCTS might not might not be able to handle it super well because it has these labeled parts. And what we found with uh, evaluating this, uh, the automaton curve is using MCTS with this automaton statistic. The no automaton curve is using MCTS without um, the automaton heuristic being built up. And we see a, a quicker convergence and like a, a, a pretty large delta in that training early on. Um, and this was, uh, we also evaluated two other environments in the single agent case actually three other environments, as well as some multi-agent evaluations, but um, the multi-agent is a bit hairy and I don't like explaining it as much. <laughs> um, but yeah, this one, uh, it really helped training early on to have this planning, uh, uh, this way of planning ahead. Uh, one interesting application of this is the transfer learning aspect. So because we have this like abstract objective space um, where we're describing like uh, what's going to happen based on the automaton space that we're at or the automaton state that we're at, um, we can transfer this to larger grids and larger game boards um, that also have other labels um, they could be, could be like we train on a 10 by 10 board, we transfer it to a 25, a 25 by 25 board. Um, and it has like similar labels, but there are also mountains. Um, and we use the statistics that we built up 
from the automaton in the 10 by 10 training. And we transfer those to our 25 by 25 training to kind of help within that tree search. And we find that it really helps. Um, and transfer learning is kind of like the first step to a generalized reinforcement learning method. Um, if you can train an algorithm on one environment and then it does well in another similar but different environment, um, it's a good thing. So uh, this is these transfer learning results. Um, so this is like after training on the 10 by 10 environment, the green is when we transfer those objectives and we see a much uh, a higher convergence rate on transfer. Um, and the automaton without transfer still performs better than our no automaton MCTS. Uh, and this is on a 25 by 25 grid, very similar to, to that one. Um, and then this one on the right is when we're using like randomized environments rather than fixed environments. Oh, and all these curves are like averages together of, of, uh, I believe, yeah, 25 training runs. Um, so like randomizing your environment is also, it, it would mean like these, uh, mountains would like show up in different places on the environment. Um, depending on, like, on different game steps. So you would kind of like be generalizing your grid space as you're training. Uh, and, that, and that helps robustness of a learning algorithm too. I, th I found these when I was making this and I thought they were kind of interesting. Um, just kind of how reinforcement learning can be used in all these different areas. And I've only really explored the games aspect of it. I'm only just playing these games. Um, but there's so many areas where, they, where it can be used specifically like transportation with some of the, um, like, I, I feel like planning ahead and, and in tandem with, with direct reinforcement learning, um, you know, could really change the way that we look at self-driving cars and multi-agent systems has a lot, has a lot to do with this transportation aspect too. But there are just so many, just a, uh, so many areas where reinforcement learning is um, being applied today, and like it's really kind of a young field uh, with, you know, lots of unknowns to research. And just as machine learning, it's like there's so many. Uh, there's so many, it's like an art and there's so many different ways that you could, you could like design these algorithms and, um, uh, like our approach is just kind of adding this automaton onto another algorithm that somebody else made. So it's like, you know, people are constantly building on, on top of, um, each other's work and just a fun, exciting field. Um, so now we're gonna, if you'd like to like, does anybody have any other questions? Um, or I can kind of. Oh, yeah. for that for that mountain with the with the house, um, good world. What's the overall? Is there an overall goal? Yeah. So the goal would be the same as the goal that we trained on, which was to in the smaller space, which is to. Um, grab two pieces of wood, which mean like go to the wood space twice, take those to the factory, which is the barn, I guess, in this instance, build a tool, eventually have three tools and go to the home space. And so is the goal simply to complete that task or to do it in some kind of like the shortest way or fastest way possible? Yeah, so the goal is to complete the task. Um, the shortness will come with time with training. Um, but yeah, so the goal is the same on both. Um, uh, yeah, like as you train, your runs will get shorter if you have a good algorithm because it will be learning like the, op it, it, the algorithm is set up to um, coax out this optimal policy. 
Um, my cat just jumped on the jumped on the. That's a nice cat. Yeah, he's he's nice. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I do have a a workshop, like a quick notebook I found. I did not author it myself, but it kind of goes over Q learning, which is direct reinforcement learning. And I'll share that in the chat for anybody that would want to check it out. And I'm going to share my screen as I go through that. Um, share screen. So Frozen Lake is similar to our grid world environment that we kind of just went over. Um, there are the snowflakes, which represent spaces uh, of ice, the holes, which represent holes in the ice, and the home space. Uh, the reason that Frozen Lake is kind of a benchmark environment is because it implements an icy, um, it's like an icy environment which means you won't always move in the direction that you intend. Um, stochastic environments are like a way to add robust, robustness to your model because um, uh, it kind of like, uh, it, it sits in for a way, it's like a, a randomization um, uh, from the environment. Uh, so it's not always like a deterministic, if you make this move, it's going to be good. So you have to kind of like explore many policies. And this is coming from this dude's like course, and he has a good amount of stuff just kind of freely available. He has one um, with Sonic where you it's like if you download Sonic, he, he shows you how to hook it up to an algorithm. So... Installing NumPy and Jim. This demo doesn't actually use any neural networks. Um, it uses NumPy to keep track of a Q matrix. And these the Q values are like the expected reward value. So it's going to keep track of a matrix at each space on the frozen lake grid. So we're going to import our dependencies. Um, let's make the environment. I know I'm just kind of clicking through this and I would typically like write it out, but I'm just clicking through it. Um, our action size, uh, because Jim is, uh, a like Jim is like a commonly used wrapper for reinforcement learning environments. So you can make a lot of, of the benchmark environments using Jim. And let me go in on that. It's probably a bit better. So um, each environment that's made using Jim will have an action space parameter. It'll have an observation space parameter. Um, and like these will have their own, like the N is like how many actions are in the action space. Um, observation space, let's see what, uh, and our action size, I think it's going to be four. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like the observation space is saying there's. 16 discrete spaces that you can be at 
and that's like a four by four grid. So it's 16 discrete places you can be at. Um, you're moving to those spaces like up, down, left, right. Those are your four actions. Um, and we're going to create our queue table. And this is kind of like a classic uh, queue learning technique um, without, you can do this without neural networks on, on a lot of grids, but this is a direct, uh, it's not a planning algorithm, um, but it is, this game would probably benefit from a planning algorithm. So this is a four by 16 grid or yeah. Um, with state size and action size columns. Okay. State size rows and action size columns. So it wants, so for each, um, for each state, uh, when there's 16 possible states, right? Um, that we're going to get Q values for the action at each state. And those Q values represent like how good that action will be, the potential rewards it may lead to. Um, so these are all hyperparameters. And if you wanted, if you did this on your own, you can like tweak these and maybe even uh, improve, like uh, improve the reward or the learning rate. Um, but in this case, the total episodes is like how many episodes you want to train for. The learning rate is a very, it's a very um, important heuristic in reinforcement learning. Uh, there are like, the at, there are optimizers as there are in other uh, computer vision, like uh, classification problems or optimizers that will adjust to like what you, the learning rate that you need for your net, like Atom and whatnot. Um, but with reinforcement learning, it's like the learning rate seems to be a very important heuristic. Um, depending on the game, depending on like how hard the game is and all that. Um, max steps is we're only going to allow 99 actions uh, per game, and then we're going to stop the game. Uh, the discounting rate is like if you have one trace uh, through the grid, uh, like one state after the other, you're going to discount the reward back through that trace. So if like you go down this trace, you discount it back up at, but each state you go back up, you like multiply by 95%. Um, and that like scales your reward throughout. Um, Exploration parameters, um, it's kind of what I mentioned earlier, you can kind of go to different states depending on if it's early on um, in your training or not. Um, the exploration rate in this case is set to decay as you get later on in the game. So at the beginning of the game, it's like explore any action you want, but near the end of the game, it's like we're only going to learn, we're only going to use the trained learned policy. So in this case, at the beginning of the game, um, like the first step, you don't have to look at the Q table at all. It just says random policy. But the last step, um, you only look at the Q table and there's no sense of exploration. And in the middle, you kind of like, you start using, um, you start using the Q table more and more and the random randomness less and less as you get to the end of the game. Uh, so here's the Q learning algorithm. We're initializing. We already did that. Initialized our state action pairs, matrix C, matrix um, for life or until learning is stopped. We choose an action in the current world based on our Q value. Uh, we take the action and um, observe the next state and the reward. And then based on the next state and the reward, we update the Q value at that state action pair. Um, a lot of times there's like a lot of really like awful looking equations like this in reinforcement learning, but 
you can kind of just like try to figure it out semantically and gloss it over. <laughs> um, list of rewards. So we're keeping track of our rewards, I guess. Um, so for episode and total episodes, this is like 2000 episodes. We reset the state at the beginning, we set done to false. And this is very similar for most reinforcement learning episodes, most reinforcement learning training loops is, they're gonna look very similar to this to put, no matter what environment you're doing. Um, so we choose an action uh, given we have, this is our exploration, um, exploitation trade-off is what that means there. Um, and that is how much are we exploring? How much are we exploiting the policy? And that's like what's decaying throughout the, uh, throughout each of these, um, uh, each game. So yeah, so then we're taking the max, uh, action based on the, based on the Q value, um, at a particular state. So like we plug the state into our Q table and then we pick the max Q value from that. George, how you doing? For the exploration rate, would it make sense to decay based on the current win rate approximation instead of decay linearly? Like yeah, it's going down by, in this example, it's going down by like 0 0.005 after mm -hmm. each step, right? Yes. So would it make sense to, instead of doing that, decay by the current win rate? So if like the win rate is 50%, then you should explore 50% of the time. Yeah, yeah, that actually does make sense. You would need like, you would need like an outer layer of this that checked the win rate and like changed that decay rate or chain or no, it would be that decay rate would be like its own function based on the win rate. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what you're saying. Yeah. I was just wondering if that's something that people do. I think, I mean, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure if like that is, I mean, I, I I'm, that's probably done. It makes <laughs> sense. It sounds like it would work. Cause like once you're more confident with your policies, um, with your exploitation, um, you don't want to explore as much. Right. Um, but for for um something like evaluation like when you're done training your net and you're trying to like see how it does uh at the end of training like evaluate on the environment you might decrease um that exploration parameter um because you want to just see how your policy is doing and not how well it does if it's doing some random states too yeah, I think setting it to zero in that case could make sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I was kind of going through this. So this is, uh, we get our action only if this, uh, uh, like we're doing a random action some percent of the time. And that's what I believe this so the, yeah, that's what we were and I were kind of just talking about is we're doing a random action some percent of the time. And that's, this is where we decide if it's going to be random or not. So this is where it's taking the random sample. And this is where it's taking, um, from the Q table. So then we've decided our action in this part of the code. We step in, we use, we, uh, have our gym environment. And each gym environment is going to have this step function. Um, so we do environment.step with some action. And the action has been chosen up here. And we get our next state. Uh, we get our reward. Uh, we get whether the environment has finished, the agent has won or not. And info is a way that we just uh, 
and you keep track of other uh, things that happen in the game or like print statements that we want to uh, logs that we want to keep track of. And so this is where that updating is happening in the queue table based on the next state, the reward, um, and the learning rate. In this case, the learning rate is directly used in this update function. Um, like nowadays, instead of a queue table, you just use a con, you just use a CNN or some network and you feed it the state, um, and the action, uh, actually the networks, you just feed it the state. Um, or I guess you're only doing, sorry, you just feed, you feed the network, the state, and it gives you action probabilities from that state. And it gives you the expected value from that state rather than using a table, um, with state action pairs. Okay. So once we update our Q table, uh, we can like increment our total rewards in this game. I believe you only get a reward at the end. So the total rewards is only going to be updated at the end, but then we set state equal to new state or next state. Um, we break from this loop if we're, if the game is finished, uh, this is where we scale down our exploration. And then we're going to start the loop over, uh, this inner loop rather, sorry, right here. Um, we're going to start the loop over and just keep playing that game, updating the queue states. Um, after each episode, we restart the entire environment and start from the beginning. Um, and then this code, it, it keeps track of our score over time and it prints out our queue table. I can just run it now. I'm not sure. I don't think that, yeah, nothing in here would require like a GPU if you're looking to run it. You don't have that. So unfortunately, they're just scaled like this, but um, this is just representing like if we start at an initial Q table, which is just all zeros, and we um, are updating that Q table over time. This is like how good each state action pair is for our agent. Okay. Oh, and in this, if you wanted to see each state, you could, you see how, it, so this is uh, uh, another play step, just using um, a queue table. And this is not updating the queue table. It's just, this is the evaluation step. And if we wanted to see each game step, we could include that there. And this runs five games. I'll just have it run one game for now. And maybe I could have it print the Q table after each game too. Okay, so what's going on here is I have it printing out the uh, the actions at each state uh, or the Q table at each state. So I'm, I'm pretty sure it's up, down, left, right would be these actions here. And it's saying it's moving down, 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 wait, but it's not moving down. 
I guess down is up for some reason in this situation. Or down would mean to the left. Sorry, that's very confusing. But it just moves through this. Uh, or no, I guess it's not. A lot of the values look the same. Yeah, because we're, I think because we're at the same state in this case, right? with this pink representing. Oh, I see. So the actions at that state are going to be the same because they're coming from yeah, that yeah. Q matrix. Um, see, in this case, we move left. Um, but where is it moving left? I guess here and here is left and then up okay okay so the actions are like should be rotated so up is going right very confusing but i guess it makes sense so up is the first one so it has the highest value so it goes up down must be the second one so it goes down here uh that doesn't make sense Sorry. <laughs> no, these are looking kind of weird. Yeah, this is me and Leo are like debugging. Okay, so Leo is my my, my uh, uh, research partner, and this is us debugging like everything. Just like that doesn't look right, <laughs> but, but yeah, feel free to you know play with this if you want to. Um, it's been about an hour now, I guess so. I'll kind of wrap this up. If you guys have any questions or or anything or whatever, you know, thanks for coming. Thank you for the presentation. Of course, of course. Um, yeah. So, you, uh, if AI at UCF has some other stuff going on. We've got some general body meetings and. Um, George, <laughs> we got a lot going on. If you're interested in that, um, I know clubs are, are so different this semester because everything's off, off campus, but yeah. Um, thanks so much for showing up guys. I'll stop the recording.